watching a few YouTube videos, seeing the impact that we have, it's a natural thing you want to talk about. If I see something cool on social media, I'm going to go to my sister. I'm going to go to my friend and say, whoa, did you see? And then that's going to trickle down. If you don't know about mercy ships, dig in a little bit. The mission is amazing. Beyond Clean offers a creative look into the inner workings of a healthcare industry committed to getting it right every instrument, every time. Join us every week as we explore the hidden world of one of the most important aspects of safe surgical care. And now your hosts, Michael Matthews, Hank Balch, and Justin Poulin. Mercy Ships began sailing on their mission to provide hope and healing to the world's forgotten poor in 1978. Many nations lack clean water, reliable electricity, medical facilities, and personnel. Because over 50% of the population lives within 100 miles of the coast, they have been able to reach more people to provide life-changing surgeries. Mercy Ships delivers a state-of-the-art hospital to port cities, providing a controlled, safe, and clean environment for patients and volunteers. This week on Beyond Clean, we speak with Lucy Nelson and Alyssa Rowe. Lucy Nelson grew up in the American Midwest and has lived in many places, including Pennsylvania, North Dakota, and Alaska. She holds a degree in psychology from the University of North Dakota and works for Onward Healthcare as a traveling sterile processing technician. She is currently on assignment at the Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio, and was a sterilization technician on Africa Mercy in 2017. Alyssa Rowe is the medical recruiter for Mercy Ships, and in this role, she works to find qualified volunteers for all hospital-related roles on board. Alyssa holds a bachelor's degree in health studies from the University of Texas at Tyler. She is passionate about helping others, enjoys traveling the world, and loves spending time with her dog Spud and Brazos. Well, Hank, Mike, this is a very special interview this week with both Lucy and Alyssa coming right up, and I'm excited to hear more about what Mercy Ships is doing to impact lives in a positive way all around the globe. Yeah, guys, this is uh, this is one of those shows that we've been trying to get on the books for a while now, and just to have the opportunity to talk to them about this incredible ministry and just you know how sterile processing techs can have an impact is a tremendous opportunity that I can't wait to talk about. We do hear a lot about medical missions in our industry, and you hear a lot about nurses and doctors, you know, going overseas, doing different trips, but you actually don't hear a lot of opportunities specifically related to sterile processing. And often the reason is they're not going to places that even have the setup to have a dedicated person do this job. On these ships, however, there is a sterile processing department, and it's a man by OR sterilization technicians. Super cool opportunity for folks to tune in today to hear from Lucy and then to hear from Alyssa on actually how to get in that process if you're interested. I can't wait to get to the interview to share these opportunities with the audience today. As a reminder, you can follow Beyond Clean on Twitter at Beyond Clean Info, the Facebook page, facebook.com slash Beyond Clean Podcast. LinkedIn is linkedin.com slash company slash Beyond Clean and our Instagram page, Beyond Clean Podcast. You can send pictures anonymously for us to post up there. We'd love to see the, some of them from Mercy Ships on our Instagram page. And also, if you do want to send one of those pictures anonymously, send us an email to info at beyondclean.net. We'll be right back with Lucy Nelson from Mercy Ships. Joining us now is Lucy Nelson, sterilization technician with Africa Mercy in 2017. Lucy, we've had a chance to take a look at Mercy Ships, the website, and learn a little bit more. And what we really want to hear from you is the insider view, a sterile processing technician working on the ship. So why don't we start at the beginning? Give us a little bit about your personal background also in sterile processing and how specifically you got involved with Mercy Ships Ministries. I came to sterile processing in a sort of roundabout way. I was actually working, most of my professional background had been in drug and alcohol treatment centers. Uh, my degree was in psychology, so that's 
the area that I had been working in for quite a while, I was reaching a point of a certain amount of burnout with that job. And I didn't want to get to the point where I was jaded and it's such a, a human service type of work. I just had to, to be careful at that point. One of the coworkers had herself become involved in sterile processing at a hospital. And so I was instantly fascinated by that. And when I was living in Fairbanks, Alaska, an opportunity came up at the hospital there. And so I applied thinking I would part-time and very rapidly turned into something that became my full-time job, which I am really grateful for. It right off the bat was was a perfect fit, you know, something that was still very much in the medical field. It was directly related to human service, but it, it had that one step removed where it, it wasn't quite as interpersonally <laughs> draining. And so the manager who hired me on was a wonderful woman named Lauren Winterton, and she and I uh, were good friends uh, during the course of my time there. She and I had lunch at one point, and she had mentioned that she was thinking about some humanitarian work and the mercy ships she had heard about and that she was really hoping to become involved with in some capacity. After we had that conversation, that stuck in my mind. It did not let me go for a year. And so I, I ended up applying myself based on that conversation that she and I had had. That was my intro into knowing about the Mercy Ships. I remain very grateful to her for that conversation. Yeah, your story there, Lucy, uh, in terms of the transition from dealing with folks, you know, person to person, face to face, and you can really see the patient that you're caring for to that one step removed, as you said, or in the case of hospitals, maybe two floors removed, and you never do get to put the face with the name of the service you're providing. That's definitely one of the biggest challenges. And What's interesting about your experience, though, is the service, as you said, it just stopped in the hospital on land, if you will. It transitioned mm -hmm. onto a ship through that mm -hmm. conversation with your boss and some of the opportunities just opening up there. You ended up aboard a Mercy ship as an OR sterilization tech. Can you walk through maybe, you know, day one? What was that experience like and how to change over the course of your time on board? The first day or two were a little overwhelming in a couple ways, but not unpleasant. It was, I think most people deal with some aspects of whether it's jet lag or culture shock. Getting there is a production for, for anybody, I think, coming from the States. You'll be flying through a lot of different time zones and several different countries to get there. One of the things that I really appreciated was that when you get to the airport, there are Mercy Ships representatives there to greet you and sort of facilitate that transition to the ship. You have to wait at sort of a passport control there for a while, which can take sometimes an hour or more. And it, it's just so nice having a friendly face there and somebody to wait with you. And from there, it's, it's a jeep ride over to the port and then onto the ship, a lot of onboarding paperwork. And then you will be shown to your cabin. Most people will end up sharing a cabin with at least three people. Uh, some cabins are larger, so you have more people, but a little bit more privacy as well. So space is small, but I think one of the things that I notice a lot of people like best about ship life is sort of that global community in miniature that you have on the ship. At any given time, there are people from maybe 30 or 40 different nations working and living on the ship. 
And so I, I can remember times being in sort of a communal area and there would be a dozen conversations going on around me and none of them were speaking English. And I, I really liked that aspect. You must be fluent in English to come to the ship. So everybody could interact but it was so wonderful having all these different people interacting with friends that they would run into from their own country and then just getting to meet and interact with people from nations that you would not be likely to encounter just sort of in your day-to-day -day life it's a very interesting cross-section of people who are interested in medicine and adventure and humanitarian work and so it's a wonderful group of people the ship crew they have a strong emphasis on your safety there are, i think some people who hear that you're going to work in africa there can be you know people can sometimes feel nervous about that but there's a security officer on the ship there are weekly security briefings so we're allowed to take outings to different areas that are approved uh, safety wise and got to see some really interesting parts of of Cameroon. The ship is docked at Douala, but um, we got to travel around the country a little bit and some interesting things. And uh, even just in the city itself, some of my favorite memories of free time are when I would go out in the town with the other people from my department who knew the area a little bit better. And we would just go to a local church on Sunday or go out for dinner at a local restaurant and things like that were really special. Living and working on a ship like that, it does force you to detach a little bit, I think, from some day-to-day -day distractions that we deal with, maybe more than we're aware of. I know I found that to be true for myself, at least, you know, just where you can find yourself getting caught up in, in the news cycle or things on TV or, or the internet. And when that isn't there and you are just focusing on the work or community or devotions or things, it can be very grounding to have. For me, it was a six-week little epoch there that was, um, that was really good. So, Lucy, that's that's great information about the life on the day to day on the ship. So describe for us what the work is like on the ships or the actual sterilization tech work that you're doing. The sterile processing department, it's very small on the ship. One room for the Deacon Tam and then one room for Prep and Pack. You're down on the same deck as all the surgical services. You have pre-op, post-op, the ward, the ORs, the SPD are all fairly close together. And so it's just a, a very small little area. There were six staff in the SPD total, uh, counting me. Um, I worked with two men from Sierra Leone, a man from Benin, and then two local women from Cameroon. And they were absolutely lovely. They were, like, as a entire department, it's the best people I've worked with. So because your space is so limited, uh, you know, even the table that we worked at, it was just a very large single workstation. And then the chair were all around that table. Even that was this really nice little aspect that added to the sense of bonding and community there. I think sometimes here, especially in bigger departments, you can get in this habit of, you know, you get to work, put your earbuds in and just kind of barely even acknowledging the, the people you're working with. And here it was loud and just everybody was talking all the time. And it's, I'm sure, not like that for every group that cycles through, but that aspect was nice. In terms of so, sort of more specifically the the day to day work, it was it was fairly standard sterile processing work. The the decontam just a, a sink and washer over there, and then on our side the prep and pack. We don't pick cases, which is one thing that's different from some departments. At least when I was there, there were very few scopes. Although I think that may depend somewhat on sort of what stage of surgery they're doing. 
during the length of a field service, which is usually about 10 months long, the ORs sort of stagger the emphasis of the surgeries that they're doing at a given time. And I think that probably relates to the surgeons who are volunteering at the time. So maybe they do mostly ortho cases for these weeks and then mostly plastics cases these weeks and so on. Um, So I wouldn't be surprised if some instrumentation does change depending on what stage they are at in that rotation. A couple of follow-ups that I can take away from that is even on a ship in international waters, which I don't know if you're really in international waters, but you're still struggling with space. <laughs> that is really a global sterilization challenge is just having maybe not the adequate amount of space, but the amount of space that we would prefer. Like you probably had enough to do your job, it sounds like, but obviously a constant challenge no matter where you are, even if it's on a Hey, mission right. ship like that, right. you know. But you brought up something then I just kind of like to get your perspective on quickly is you said your department was a joyful department and that everyone mm-hmm. in the department worked together as a team. Y'all talked and had fun. If you could boil that down maybe to one or two reasons why, why do you think the culture in your particular team in your department was so good on your mission? That's a really good question. There was perhaps a a greater sense of openness in some regards. I I tend to, especially being a traveler, have a habit of when I come into a new hospital, just doing everything I can to fly under the radar, (laughs) especially for the first few weeks, just, you know, not draw attention to myself in any way, just sort of sit back, observe what the vibes are, how people interact. And so I'm used to being fairly quiet and not jumping in and getting involved in conversations. I just don't think in that department there wasn't a lot of pretense. (laughs) People weren't playing mind games with each other. This is a tricky one for me, to be honest, partly because the staff in any department, by definition, when you have, you know, these volunteer positions, they they rotate in and, you know, people rotate in and out. So the atmosphere is almost certainly going to be different to this group. It won't be the same. So I don't want to say, well, that's just how it is in that department. But I guess I was lucky enough that that was my experience of the department when I was there, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, a little less cultural then and a little more technical a question that kind of came up in our planning and everything. So you've got folks from different countries working in the same mm-hmm. department. What standards are you following? Are you adopting American standards and recommendations from Amy? Or do you have some other uh, international standards that you're following in terms of how you're processing and what you're testing, what you're documenting, those sort of things? I believe they were following the Amy guidelines. I know that the crew that I was working with were, uh, like my bosses were ISHM certified and the really neat things that they were doing was training several other members of the department to study for the ISHM sterile processing certification exam. So that relates to, I think, one of my favorite things that Mercy Ships does, which is called a capacity building or capacity training. But it's this idea of strengthening and supporting existing health systems in clinics or hospitals and training local people in the health field. So as relates specifically to sterile processing, there's a woman named Christina Fast, who has been volunteering and working with Mercy Ships for years now, and she will bring in people from sterile processing department in the, the local hospitals, teach them proper procedures, even bring them on board the ship and like, here's a real sterile processing department. This is how it works. This is how you do things. I happened to meet her very briefly when I was in Cameroon, but she's 
kind of a, a personal hero of mine. I think that type of work is incredible and such a blessing and, and a huge advantage of what mercy ships can do because it, I mean it's great that in and of itself to go there and remove somebody's cataracts that's amazing but to be there and for 10 months to train hospitals how to do things you know and how to improve so that they are even better equipped when the ship leaves, I just think that is wonderful. So, Lucy, what has been your most surprising thing that you've learned about living on a ship or maybe living uh, off the coast of Africa? There are a couple of things that come to mind. I, I would say that one that took me a little bit by surprise was my relationship to conservation, uh, to put it broadly, you know, things like water and food and reusable items. I thought of myself as somebody who was pretty conscientious about things like that. But when you're on board the ship, you are expected to take two minute showers <laughs> and that's reasonable and that's all you need when you think about it. But I have, man, I can think of times I have just stood in the shower to warm up or stood in the shower and pondered life's great questions, <laughs> just letting water run down the drain. And that's something that really changed moving on the ship, thinking about things like that, again, with food, where you really are in a situation where resources and supplies available are more limited, it does force you to just think more conscientiously about waste. That took me by surprise because, as I said, I thought that I was you know, more self-aware in that aspect. But I think the other area that I really noticed that I was sort of caught off guard was my personal bubble had to shrink a little bit. Like I, I'm quite an introvert in some ways, so I recharge best when I am by myself. And when you are on a ship <laughs> docked somewhere with several hundred other people, there just are not really going to be that many places you can be by yourself. So instead of needing a whole room to feel like I'm by myself, you would get to a point where if you could find just a quieter corner of a room, you felt alone, you felt by yourself. And so I think that was a good exercise in being able to be grounded and be within as well. So Lucy, as we talk to many sterile processing technicians via this podcast, I'm sure several are thinking right now, you know, how do I get involved so how would you encourage CS SPD technicians who are considering this opportunity? What would you what would you tell them to do to to research it, to consider the opportunity? What what encouragement would you give them? There's some things that I think would help me if I were heading into this process. Don't be daunted by the fundraising aspect or the amount of money that you likely will need to do this. Volunteer, which means you need to be able to go however long you volunteer for with no income. And you do cover your room and board in the form of crew fees. So it can look a little challenging perhaps, but I think a lot of people have been pleasantly surprised by the way that family and friends and community often do come together in support for things like this. And it's a beautiful thing to see that happen. And I know I would not have been able to cover this out of pocket. So I'm very grateful to all of those people who enabled me to go and serve in that way. It is a rigorous application process, so I would say if you have applied or you're in the process of applying, don't be discouraged by that process or if you haven't heard back yet. It is lengthy, but I think a very good thing that the application is as thorough as it is. And then lastly, I think it's likely that this experience will test you in some way for different people. You know, it will be different things, but when you make it through, you will have done 
and been a part of something really special. There's a bigger reason. I believe that we as cell processing techs know how to do what we do. For me, that was working with the Mercy ships. Well, Lucy, that's great insight. I want to thank you for coming on the show this week and sharing your experience with all of our listeners. Thank you so much for having me. I I really appreciate the work that that you guys are doing with this podcast. I I think it's outstanding. Excellent. Well, we enjoy it as much as you enjoyed your time on Mercy Ships. And then next up, we're going to speak with Alyssa Rowe, who's a medical recruiter. So she'll leap right off what we were just talking about with Lucy. We'll be right back after this. Joining us now is Alyssa Rowe, medical recruiter with Mercy Ships. Alyssa, in the first segment, we had a chance to talk with Lucy, but we're very excited to hear your perspective on the great work that Mercy Ships is doing. So welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on tonight. Mercy Ships, we are a Christian-based company where we strive to follow the 2,000-year-old model of Jesus, bringing hope and healing to the world's forgotten poor, and we do that by using hospital ships. And so that's what makes us unique. Right now, we are serving the west coast of Africa in the country of Cameroon, and we will be moving to Guinea in our next field service in August. But, you know, what we do is we use our ship, which is actually the largest non-governmental hospital ship in operation, and it's named the Africa Mercy. In this ship, we have five ORs and 72 patient beds where we're able to provide that free surgical care for people in Africa and these poor countries that don't hardly have access to medical care at all. How many folks are we talking about on the ship who are are providing medical care? Because I'm assuming... It's not the same folks who are doing the medical care who uh, are piloting the ship or captaining the ship, I guess they call it. Can right. you kind of break down just, you know, sheer numbers wise what we're talking about? At any given time, we have somewhere between 400 and 450 volunteers on board, and about 200 of those are medical, and that includes everything from our surgeons to nurses to dentists and eye team and physical therapy team, everything we have on board, and of course, sterilizers as well. So, Alyssa, kind of along the goal of this segment on the show is we're hoping that, you know, somebody out there is going to hear this and they're going to want to get involved. What is sort of the onboarding process that new volunteers can, you know, expect? We are trying to make our application very easy for folks. If they're wanting to learn more about us, we have an online community called My Mercy where they can go online and read blogs. They can ask questions. They can interact with other potential applicants or people on board, and even our recruiting team is on there. So they can really get a firsthand look of what life is like on the ship and what serving with Mercy Ships is like. But when you do say, yes, I want to volunteer, you can just go online and complete an application. And it's a little in-depth, but just because we want to make sure we're getting all the right information about you and about your qualifications to come serve. And so you have filled that out, and it'll be submitted for reviews. And as soon as that happens, a facilitator will be in touch, and they can go over the steps after that, talking about uh, immunizations and physical evaluation references, things like that. And they'll also be the ones to help line up your travel and your flights, making sure your dates line up. But really, the application process is pretty simple. You know, there's no in-person interview since we are such an international organization. Being based in Texas, that would make it difficult. I get that question a lot. You know, do I have to travel to Texas? And unless you're serving for more than one year, you don't have to go through our formal onboarding process in Texas. You just would go through a, an orientation once you get on the ship, and they would help teach you the little things that you'll need to know about ship life and your role on board. Yeah, I can imagine some people maybe aren't prepared for uh, seasickness that might hit them when they first get out there. So you probably have some tips mm-hmm. for to help people with that. But I wanted to ask you, I, I heard about Mercy Ships through Hank and social media because he was promoting it. And I know at the same time trying to set up an interview. But how do people typically hear about Mercy Ships? How do they find you when they don't hear about you on a really spectacular podcast, you know, for example? (laughs) Well, um, that answer definitely varies. I think the biggest one is word of mouth. 
I come and serve and I come home and I tell my friend who tells another friend and, you know, it just kind of travels that way. But we do a lot of recruiting events, especially medical. We do a lot of conferences. We have church recruiting where we try to get involved with churches that want to share. We have alumni engagement where our alumni are able to step out a little bit and help share the word. And of course, social media is such a major tool uh, where we can share about us and promote the events we have going on or the activities that we have going on to share that way. But definitely word of mouth is a big thing and probably the most effective because you hear about it and you say, oh, that's cool. But when you hear, yeah, I went and this is what happened and this is how it changed me, that's what really, I think, convinces people to say, I need to be a part of this. Alyssa, what is the you know the minimum time commitment that uh, is expected for new applicants, and and how long have some of the more longer tenured people been on board? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, when you're talking about time commitment, it depends on the role. So for our sterilizers on board, our minimum is six weeks. For some roles, such as surgeons or dentists, OR nurses, those are as little as two weeks. And then a lot of nursing roles are eight weeks. More of the technical maritime roles are going to be longer term. Our academy on board, we have certified teachers. That's going to be a year commitment. Any leadership role, of course, is going to be a long-term commitment of at least a few years. But when you're talking about how long people come and serve, uh, it's so cool that our chief medical officer, Gary Parker has actually been on board, oh gracious, uh, probably almost 30 years, if not 30 years. So, you know, some people come and they fall in love with Mercy Ships, so they come back all the time. Some people come and fall in love with the country that we're in, and so they decide to start going back to that country to do their missions. So it's interesting to see that in different people, but You know, there's definitely a little bit of everything on board, people who've been there for years and people who are there the first time. So when you look at an applicant, for instance, I can understand in terms of credentials, you know, looking for some certifications in the field or a particular license, but I'm assuming there are also some other maybe softer skills that you're looking for. Can you walk us through a little bit more about what a profile of uh, a good candidate for this opportunity would be? We need people to be encouraging. We want people to be not necessarily people persons, you know, but we want them to be able to come on board and just open their arms and be a part of our community. You're going to have interaction with locals, whether they be patients or some of our day crew that helps us with translation You're going to be interacting with people in your department and people in other departments when you're in the dining hall or anywhere else. You know, we have people from different countries, up to 30 or 40 different countries at a time are represented on board. So just being able to go in with an open mind and and almost an excitement to learn things, um, I think that's important. But we also want people to come on board and be mission-minded. You know, we are a Christian organization But, you know, if others want to come serve because they want to be a light and be a help to the people that we're serving, we're okay with that. We want people to be able to come on board and feel welcomed and feel that warmth that just radiates through our community on board. I know this question is going to come up because it comes up a lot of times on these opportunities, even in opportunities like the armed forces is, can I bring a buddy with me? <laughs> is it okay to <laughs> apply together and, you know, try to get on the same ship or I guess the same service time? Is that a possibility? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we have so many different roles on board. Pretty much anything you can think of in your community at home, we have on board. So if you are a nurse and your buddy is a carpenter, come on board. We have roles for you guys. You know, the minimum commitment might be a little different, so you may have to adjust to meet the longer commitment, but um, we definitely do. We have families that come. We have sisters that come. We have friends, maybe nurse friends that all work in the same department and they enjoy serving together. And then we have people that have met on board and enjoy serving, so they always try to come back together. But in the application, if that's the case, you can say, um, you know, I want to serve as the same time as John 
or you can make sure you're putting the same date range. You can always specify what dates you're available and make sure the friend is doing the same. But we love to have people on board. I think that probably makes it a little more fun. You talked initially about how many ORs and how many beds there are. You know, how many procedures are you doing on sort of an average basis, and how many patients do you serve in you know, a, a week, a month, or a year? Oh, I wish I had really good specific numbers on that, but I do know that I heard last week that we have performed, since we got to Cameroon in August, uh, that we've already performed 1,300 cataract surgeries, and we aren't going to be closing our hospitals until the end of May. So, you know, that number alone is pretty amazing to me because that's one of our six specialties. So if you if you do the math, those numbers are pretty incredible. Well, so with those 1,300 procedures there, everyone listening to this podcast is thinking, well, okay, so whoever those OR sterilization techs are, they're definitely keeping themselves busy. And you know, the whole background for the show in this episode to focus on mercy ships actually is that specific opportunity that's out there now to apply for OR sterilization positions. I was wondering if you could go into that particular opportunity, but then also if say someone's not necessarily ready yet, but they are in the future how often those opportunities come available or where they can go to keep their eye out for it. First, I'll kind of key in on our critical need roles. Some of those are always critical needs, and the biggest right now is OR sterilizers. We cannot find enough. No matter what we do, we just are having a hard time. So finding people to fill that role for dental assistance, for I-team those are our biggest needs right now medically. Of course, we have different roles as well. We need teachers and we need bakers and we need electricians. But speaking medically, OR sterilizer is always a big need. You know, people that are hearing this saying, that's me, I'd love to come, go online to apply.mercyships.org and you can fill out an application. If you say, I want to do this, but I just can't commit right now, go ahead and go do that anyway. You can choose the option to serve in the future, and that'll put you in our talent pool. They'll keep you engaged with us. They'll let you know when we're starting a new field service or somebody canceled and we have an urgent need. You can step up and be the person to fill that role. If you ever feel like you're going to be interested in doing this, go ahead and sign up because we don't want you to forget about us. And so this will help us keep you engaged and informed and, and ready to serve. You talked to, at the beginning of this segment about the vision for Mercy Ships, and our vision for this podcast is all about spreading education and information globally about this industry known as sterile processing. And I know you mentioned the academy that's on the ship, and I was wondering, in terms of training local professionals, so you said that you're in Cameroon now, what does it look like on the ground floor in terms of training those folks in Cameroon of the, the techniques and, and even some of the technology that could be used there when that ship moves on to the next opportunity? Something that's really important to us is teaching and training. Uh, now, I mentioned the academy, and that's actually a specific school for our cruise children, but we do have a medical capacity building, and that's where we bring in locals and we teach them medical skills. You know, if we have specialist surgeons in the country, uh, if we're able to find some, we haven't had a whole lot of luck in Cameroon, but we want to bring them in and, and really teach them what we know. If we have nurses or, or medical students, we want to bring people in and teach them what we know. And sterilization is key, I believe. Some countries that may have a very, very little access to medical, but in these countries, people think of hospitals as a place that they go and die. If they are to find a surgeon and could possibly afford to pay for the surgery, they're very likely going to die of infection because they just don't have safe medical care, safe surgical care. And so in our medical capacity building, we teach the World Health Organization checklist so that they're making sure everything they do is up to par with that. Uh, we teach sterilization techniques. We teach everything that we can that they can continue when we leave because our hope is that we don't have to return to them because they are able to provide that safe medical care for themselves. 
Alyssa, I imagine there are an awful lot of people uh, who are going to hear this and are going to say, man, that is awesome. Uh, I really wish I could be a part of it, but I just can't commit the time. Are there other mm-hmm. ways that people who want to contribute can contribute? Yes, definitely. The thing I always tell people is if you can volunteer, please come on board and give back by experiencing this amazing mission. But if you can't volunteer, sponsor a friend to come or donate to Mercy Ship so we can continue doing this. If you can't donate, tell others. Share our post on Facebook and LinkedIn and everywhere else that we might be. Watching a few YouTube videos, seeing the impact that we have, it's a natural thing you want to talk about. If I see something cool on social media, I'm going to go to my sister. I'm going to go to my friend and say, whoa, did you see? And then that's going to trickle down. So I think if you don't know about mercy ships, dig in a little bit. The mission is amazing. I encourage people to go just learn about it a little bit. And I think that the sharing of the word, uh, maybe just sharing on social media, but I think that kind of takes care of itself when you see the amazing things that God is doing. And above all else, pray. Pray for the country that we're serving. Pray for our crew on board. Pray that we will be able to continue bringing this safe medical care to the nations that so desperately need it, and also that they're going to see the light of Jesus shining through our crew as we work to serve them. Excellent, Alyssa. Thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing all the good work that you're doing. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. That was Alyssa Rowe, and before her, Lucy Nelson from Mercy Ships. Hank, Mike, this was a great episode, and I really appreciate them sharing all the good work that they're doing In an industry that anyone who works in sterile processing, we come into this job or into the industry, if you're a vendor on the leadership side of things as well, we come in with a passion to help folks. And ultimately, if you're helping in the basement of a hospital in Alaska, or if you're helping on board a ship off the coast of Cameroon, that mission is the same, even though the context changes. However, it's this opportunity, this special opportunity to come and give of not only yourself, but your time and your expertise, as Lucy mentioned, in training and passing on these best practices wherever that ship ends up. Uh, fantastic ministry and a great opportunity. So excited that we got to share that today with our audience. Absolutely. I know that, you know, 19 year old me would have been chomping at the bit to, for an opportunity like this. And, you know, you think about all the positive impact that SPD techs have and the opportunity to take that on a global scale and bring that to people who otherwise would not have that kind of care is really just a unique opportunity and just something that everybody should really be able to get behind in one way or another. Yeah, definitely would encourage our listeners to go to the website, learn a little bit more. As both Lucy and Alyssa mentioned, it is a long process, so plenty of time to do your investigative work if you feel like volunteering your time for a special cause. That's going to do it for this week's show. As a reminder, you can help support us by subscribing to Beyond Clean on iTunes and Stitcher. We'd certainly appreciate a rating and a review because your feedback is important. And if you have any topics that you'd like us to cover on a future episode, or if you'd like to share a picture anonymously on our Instagram page, just send us an email to info at beyondclean.net. On behalf of Hank, Mike, and myself, thank you for listening to another edition of Beyond Clean.